While we've discussed the basic principles of locking and the two-phase locking protocol, we did not discuss at which granularity we are locking our objects. We can lock at the row level, at the table level, at the entire database level. There obviously is a trade-off between concurrency and overhead with respect to the granularity of locking. If you are always locking entire databases, then we have very low concurrency. We don't have parallel access to the same database, but we have very low overhead. If you are always locking at a row level, then we have high concurrency, but we also have a high overhead. So the idea is to use multi-granularity locking that decides the level of the locks depending on the query. So it decides depending on the query whether we lock only rows or we lock entire tables and so on. The idea of multi-granularity locking is to decide the granularity of the locks depending on the characteristics of the query. So let's have a look at our first query. Our first query is a query that selects from the customer table, the customer with ID 42. And the ID is a key for this table. So we are selecting a single row. For such a row selecting query, we will typically choose a row lock. Why would we want to lock the entire table if we just look at a single row or just a few rows? Let's look at another query. Our query 2 selects all the rows in the customer's table. So this is a query that scans the entire table. For this query, it would be a massive overhead to lock each single row. So it's much better to lock the entire table. So we have two different queries, one with a row lock, one with a table lock. The question is, how do these queries know of each other's locks? These locks are at different levels of granularity. In order to achieve that locks at different levels of granularity know of each other, databases use so-called intention locks. We've seen that there are shared locks to read objects, there's exclusive locks to write objects, and now we also have intention shared and intention exclusive locks. Intention shared is abbreviated as IS, intention exclusive as IX. Roughly, the idea is that before a transaction can lock an object in shared or exclusive mo mode, first the transaction has to introduce intention shared or intention exclusive locks respectively on all the coarser levels of granularity. So for instance, if a transaction wants to lock a row in exclusive mode, it first has to introduce an intention exclusive lock on the database and an intention exclusive lock on the table that contains the row. And only if these are granted, it can obtain the exclusive lock on the row. So we have now four types of locks shared, exclusive, intention shared, and intention exclusive. And together with these, we have an extended conflict matrix. So we've already discussed shared and exclusive locks. Shared locks do not conflict with shared locks, but of course, exclusive locks conflict with shared and exclusive locks. Now let's have a look at the new combinations. Shared locks do not conflict with intention shared locks. If one transaction has a shared lock on some object, it's fine if another transaction introduces an intention shared lock. It just means that this other transaction wants to have a shared lock on some final level of granularity. For instance, if the shared lock is on the table and another transaction introduces an intention shared lock on the same table, it just means the other transaction wants to have a shared lock on some row and that's fine. However, a shared lock on a table does not go together with an intention exclusive lock on the same table, because it means that the other transaction with the intention exclusive lock 
wants to have an exclusive lock on the final level of granularity, so wants to exclusively lock one row, and an exclusive lock of, on one, of one row, and does not lock, go together with a shared lock on the entire table. Exclusive locks, of course, conflict with everything. Since this table is symmetric, so you can mirror it along the diagonal, we've already discussed this part, but we still need to discuss this part. Intention locks do not conflict with each other. So an intention shared does not conflict with intention shared. That's clear. Maybe let's discuss why intention exclusive locks do not conflict with each other. So let's assume that you have two transactions that want to introduce an intention exclusive lock on a table. That's fine because they just signal their intention to lock one of the rows exclusively. And if they lock different rows, that's fine. If they try to lock the same rows, then we have a conflict on the row level. But on the table level, we don't have a conflict yet. The multigranularity locking protocol works as follows. Before a transaction is allowed to lock a particular granule G, so this is an object at a particular level of granularity, so before the transaction is allowed to lock G in shared or exclusive mode, the transaction first has to obtain intention shared or intention exclusive locks respectively on all the coarser levels of granularity that contain the granule G. And only when all of the intention shared locks have been granted, then the transaction is allowed to obtain the lock on the granule G in the announced mode. So let's have a look at two examples, our query one that we've seen before. So this was the row selecting query that has selected the customer with ID 41. So it selects a single row from the customer's table. So this query would first need to obtain an intention shared lock on the database. Once this is granted, it needs to obtain an intention shared lock on the table. And only if both are granted, it can obtain a shared lock on the row with the ID 42. For our second query, that was the query that has scanned the entire customer's table, it would first need to obtain an intention shared lock on the database. And once this is granted, it can obtain a shared lock on the table customers. Now suppose that a third query comes in. This third query is an updating query that wants to update the name of the customer with ID 17. So how would this query proceed? It first needs to obtain an intention exclusive lock on the database and an intention exclusive lock on the table customers. And if both are granted, it is allowed to obtain an exclusive lock on the row with ID 17. Now let's determine in how far this conflicts with the queries that we've seen before, query one and query two. Query one was a row selecting query. So query one has first obtained an intention shared lock on the database and an intention shared lock on the table customers before obtaining a shared lock on the row with customer 42. So the intention shared lock on the database does not conflict with the intention exclusive lock on the database by query three, because intention locks do not conflict. The intention shared lock on the table likewise does not conflict with the intention exclusive lock on the table, because intention locks do not conflict. And on the row level, the queries do not conflict because the shared lock concerns a different row than the exclusive lock. The shared lock is for the row 42, whereas the exclusive lock is for row 17. So query 1 and query 3 do not conflict, they are compatible. Now let's have a look at query 2. Query 2 was a table scanning query. We've scanned the entire customer's table. So query 2 has obtained first an intention shared lock on the database. This is fine, as we've discussed. And then it has obtained a shared lock on the table customers. And the shared lock on the table customers conflicts with the intention exclusive lock 
on the table customers. Because a shared lock, we want to have the entire table shared locked, and an attention exclusive lock says that we want to have exclusively, exclusively some part of the table, and this does not go along with each other. So we have a conflict on the table level between the shared lock on the table of query two and an intention exclusive on the table of query three. So query three would have to wait until the shared lock on the table is released by the second query. 